Well, hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Doctor, and I'm a faculty member in the physics department at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak with your group today, and I look forward to continuing the conversation in the Q and A session. So the title of my talk looks suspiciously like a book that I just published uh, with my co-author Jose Mestre. So he recently retired from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and prior to that he was also at UMass Amherst and so some of the the things that we give as examples of research studies in the book are based on things that he did at both of those institutions and I was a postdoc with him from 2009 to 2011. So this was a two-year project that we worked on, um, Science of Learning Physics, and it just came out from the publisher in December. So you can find it on the World Scientific Publishing Company website or on Amazon if you're interested. Um, so part of the reason that we wrote this book um, is a little bit of frustration that we've been in physics education research for a while. And uh, what we've noticed as faculty at you know, teaching physics at the college level is that a lot of things we know about physics education research aren't being utilized at the college level. And so uh, we, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that, I guess, and people are studying why it isn't being used more, but maybe having another resource out there might help people decide to start using some of these ideas. Uh, so the book is structured to include different sections, like we highlight examples of research from not just physics education fields, but from cognitive psychology, education psychology, the learning sciences. And then we have a section that is just on what we feel are some of the instructional implications of that research. And then we give try to give some concrete examples of what you could actually do in a classroom to apply some of those those research findings. Um, so I've highlighted the word deeper here because Jose and I also collaborated on a more scholarly article back in 2014. It's in the Physical Review Physics Education Journal called uh, Discipline, a Synthesis of Discipline-Based Education Research in Physics. And so that article is a little bit more uh, what I would call scholarly or formal. And the book, we tried to make a little bit more informal with some of our anecdotes and ideas so hopefully it's a you know a little bit easier to read. So in this talk, I want to kind of highlight some of the things we found as we were researching for this this book. And as I was typing up the chapter titles, I realized we wrote really long chapter titles. So I highlighted some of these keywords here. So you'll notice that some of these first chapters are probably familiar if you know a little bit about physics education research. And so the field of physics education research um, is getting to be 40, 40 years old now. It began in the late 70s, early 80s, and it started a lot with research on conceptual difficulties that students had learning physics. And so we have a, a chapter that talks a little bit about that. And then also on problem solving, which is another area that uh, was a, a you know, kind of a starting point for physics education research. And chapter three in between there has some overlap with both of those. So a lot of the research that was done at the beginning was based on how experts uh, think about physics and solving physics problems, and also how novices or beginning students, people who aren't as experienced in the field of physics, think about it. Um, and then that resulted in a lot of curricula, cur curricular de development and things like interactive engagement techniques, active learning strategies to help address those conceptual difficulties and issues with problem solving that we saw in our classrooms. So that's kind of chapters two through five really are more based on physics education research, but also might have a little bit of a cognitive slant to them too. Chapters six and seven, and hopefully I'll have some time to talk a little bit more about those, uh, those are based more on psychology research that I don't think has quite made its way into discipline based education research yet. And so I learned a lot about what students have as perceptions of their own learning and what they believe will help their learning, which actually doesn't help their learning and some other study habits which are more effective ones that aren't as effective. So I'll try and spend a little bit more time on that. 
and the testing effects uh, ties in directly to some of those perceptions and study habits too. We tossed around the idea of having an eighth chapter that was more about non-cognitive aspects related to learning like um, motivational issues, self-efficacy, maybe gender differences that we've seen in physics, um, but we just kind of decided that we couldn't do it justice in, in this book and we don't know as much about those areas. Um, so we ended up leaving it out, but we do recognize that those issues also play a big role <clears throat> in, in learning physics. All right, so if you're a physics teacher or a physics instructor, um, you've, you've probably told people what you do and you get one of two or three reactions. You get, oh, I loved my physics class in high school. That rarely happens to me. <laughs> or you get someone saying like, oh, physics was so hard, I hated it. Um, or you must be really smart to be a physics teacher. Um, so I, I think that, why is it that we get these reactions? Why is it that students, you know, feel like physics is such a difficult thing to learn. Um, one of the reasons that we know from research is that students have, you know, even people in general, not just our students, they have ideas about how the world works and based on their observations and their experiences. And many of those ideas are inconsistent with the way that scientists think about uh, think about how the world works or the, the physics explanation for how things works. And one of the most how things work. And one of the most common examples is this idea that a lot of people believe heavier objects fall faster, which is not true. But in your everyday experience, if you drop a hammer and you drop a feather, chances are the hammer is going to hit the ground first. Um, but if you show your students a video, you know, the astronauts go up to the moon and they do it, they'll hit the ground at the same time. And, and so, um, you know, that's Maybe that will help change their ideas, but um, people have these these beliefs that are very hard to change. Newton's third law is another big one. Uh, that idea that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, or um, things that exert opposite, equal and opposite forces on each other. So if you have a really heavy truck and it's you know, colliding with a smaller car, that they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. That's really hard to change students' ideas about about it because it runs so counterintuitive to what they've seen in their everyday experience. So that's one reason why it's difficult to learn physics. Um, the other, the other reason uh, that I have on here is it's maybe partly our fault. <laughs> so there's this phenomenon called the expert blind spot. And so once we as instructors know a lot about physics and we've been doing it for a while, it becomes really hard for us to put ourselves back in that position of being someone who doesn't know physics or is learning it from the, for the first time. And so putting ourselves back in the shoes of our students or of a novice can be really hard to do. And so one example is if your students are trying to work on a problem and, and they say like, well, I just don't even know where to start. <laughs> and for us, that might be really hard hard to to grasp because we can look at it and say well obviously you just you know, apply conservation of energy or something so for us it's really obvious but for our students it's not really obvious how to proceed on on that but i'll talk about in here how you can sort of uh, guide students to to have some ways of dealing with that like maybe draw a picture write down what you're given you know think about the concepts and principles involved but it can be really hard for us to break down the processes that we're using because they've become so tacit. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight key, a few key things from each chapter. Um, so the first one is on concept formation and we know from, there's oodles and oodles of research in physics education about difficulties that students have learning particular concepts in physics. And so we know that you know students are not coming to us as blank slates, they have existing ideas or prior knowledge about how the world works. And there was a video series back in the 90s when I was going through a teacher preparation program with from Annenberg Media, Private Universe, and also like Minds of Our Own. Um, so there's some, I think a lot of the ideas that came up in that video series are still relevant today. Students are constructing their own understandings of what's going on in the world. And they can be very, these ideas can be very difficult to change. Uh, I took a whole class in graduate school on conceptual change theory. <laughs> and so, um, and there are a lot of different theories that people have related to a conceptual understanding. Um, but the, the key implication, I think, of this research is that we need to find out where our students are at. And so we need to be asking them what they think to share their knowledge. And there are different ways that you can elicit that knowledge. So one of the resources that I've come to really enjoy is Paige Keeley's work 
and she has a book that's just 75 science formative assessment classroom techniques things like think pair share or you know writing a muddiest point uh, you know different things that you can do in your classroom uh, not just to uh, elicit students ideas but also to you know, kind of gauge where they're at maybe towards the end of a class too um, so they're called uh, a lot of um that she has they're called misconception probes and sometimes these ideas that students have are called misconceptions sometimes alternative conceptions or naive conceptions but the the book series on uncovering student ideas in science are based on middle school research and also high school um, information and so those books are really good because they talk about the research findings and then give you some examples of probes you could use where a lot of them are multiple choice questions where the distractors are based on common ideas that people have and i've used a lot of these in my classroom um, i teach a class that's physical science for future elementary school teachers and so these have been really useful there too um, things like uh, they you know one probe that i've used a lot is uh, what which of these materials will stick to a magnet and almost always like a lot of students at the beginning of the semester will say all metals will stick to a magnet and then we do some experiments and we see oh no like an you know, aluminum foil magnet doesn't stick to that it doesn't stick to copper pipes um, but even when I ask them again at the end of class at the end of the semester at least a third of my students will still tell me that all metals will stick to a magnet and so that just shows me how important some of this um, this research is and how critical it is to really try and address students conceptual understanding and ideas in the classroom and some of these resources can really help you with doing that so uh, I, I kind of mentioned how expert novice research is, was an early part of physics education research and it kind of overlaps with both the conceptual chapter and the problem solving chapter but uh, if you if you've read any of that or are familiar with that uh, the studies found that there are differences in the way that more experienced physicists structure their knowledge and memory and also the way that they approach the problem solving. And so they did some of these studies on categorization where they had problems written on little index cards and people had to place them into piles or classify them in some way. And the experts that they were studying would classify them based on the concepts and principles that you would use to actually solve the problems, whereas more inexperienced novices would classify them based on surface level features like oh this is an inclined plane problem has springs in it pulleys um, I did a follow-up study with with Jose at Illinois and we found that they also sometimes talked about the quantities in the problems like velocity or acceleration and we're using those to classify the problems um, but then we also see that this carries over into into problem solving and so students often will use a very haphazard or disconnected approach to problem solving they, they're kind of looking for equations hunting for equations that will have some of the quantities in them that are listed in the problem they aren't always thinking about the bigger picture in terms of the concepts and principles so as an instructor what can you do to try and emphasize um, that more and really elevating the role of concepts and principles in your class is important so one idea is to um, give them practice with categorization uh, Jose had a study called the hat study <laughs> he had a computer program that was a hierarchical I think hierarch hierarchical analyzation tool or something so students would see a, a physics problem and they had to click a button of like with this what kind of key principles and concepts would be used to solve that that problem so getting them to think about that before they even go about solving it um, trying to classify different problems um, there's another way to assess categorization where maybe you have a, a, a problem statement and then below it you have two two problem statements and you say which of these two would be solved most like this first problem so there are different ways to practice that strategy writing is an is, is a technique where students write down the principle that um, you know before they even solve the problem they write down the principle they would use to solve it a justification for why that principle is applicable to this particular problem and then a plan for how they're going to apply it before they even start um, you know writing out equations and things like that uh, another way, another idea is to help students organize their physics knowledge by things like 
a concept map. I've put a little picture on this slide uh, and maybe you do this in your classes too. You can kind of build up a concept map for students as you learn the different topics. What are some of the key ideas that you've learned about, you know, starting with maybe kinematics or forces, whatever you start with. How does that connect to um, energy and momentum? So you kind of build up these ideas and even as a poster or something on, you know, in your classroom that they can refer back to and when they're thinking about how to solve a, a problem, what is the key concept or principle that applies here. And even the way that we model how to solve problems is really important in the class and trying to make those, those steps that you just do automatically, trying to make them more explicit while you're solving a problem for students. So I, I did my PhD at the University of Minnesota and they, their physics education group there really emphasizes problem solving um, strategies and things like that. So I feel like this is one of my areas of expertise and I did write this chapter in the book. Um, but what we know about problem solving is that there are differences, there are expert novice differences that I mentioned before. And uh, experts will often do kind of an, a low level qualitative analysis of a problem before jumping into equations where they think about the concepts and principles that apply. But in addition to that, they are also able to monitor their progress as they're working through a problem. If things don't seem like they're they're making sense or working right, they'll cycle back and, and try a different strategy. At, at the end, they'll have some strategies to look at whether or not their answer, final answer makes sense, maybe looking at limiting cases or analyzing the units, things like that. And so physics education research has a lot of instructional materials for teaching problem solving. Um, there are a lot of different types of problems. Minnesota likes to use uh, context rich problems. So instead of just having like your classic box on an incline plane, maybe you have some movers who are trying to, you know, push a crate up and up an incline or something like that, um, giving it some context. Um, but our, in our book and also in that uh, synthesis paper, we talk about some different kinds of problems problem types. Um, you can also use a framework with your students, have them explicitly draw out a picture, have them describe what approach they're going to use, you know, some diagrams, writing out the equations and symbols before they start plugging in numbers or planning their solution before they actually um, plug in the numbers too. And so there are ways that you can help to structure that problem solving process for students. When you're maybe doing an example with students in class, you can certainly model the productive behaviors that you want to see them actually do when they're solving problems. And so making sure that you also are showing all your steps, not shortcutting the process so that students um, are also going to engage in those productive behaviors. Um, there are a lot of different ways to assess problem solving too. Um, you know, so you want it to be consistent with the way that you modeled it for them and the way that you're emphasizing things in your class. You could use rubrics. Um, I developed one when I was at the University of Minnesota called the Minnesota Assessment of Problem Solving Maps Rubric. Um, but there's also ways that you can assess problem solving with things like uh, giving them a solution to a problem that contains an error and the students have to find the error. And so that's, that's a very high level task. We tried some of that um, in, in studies we did with high schools when I was at the University of Illinois and very few people could actually find the conceptual errors in, in those questions. So it's a very high level task, it's something that you could certainly try with students. All right, so uh, active learning <laughs> is one of those things where um, you know everybody uses that word, but what does it really mean? Um, so in in physics, I feel like it's a term that's used to mean anything that's not traditional passive instruction. So if you're just lecturing in front of a group of students and they're trying to write down what you say, I would call that traditional instruction. Um, and anything that's <laughs> more active than that is oftentimes called interactive engagement techniques or active learning strategies. Um, but it could have, you know, this word can have different meanings depending on your discipline or even people in psychology, I think, sometimes define this differently than than what we do in physics. But the key key idea is that students can't just be watching the show. <laughs> and I know that we love doing demos and impressing people and how, how cool is physics, but they actually need to be 
actively participating in the process. And it doesn't mean that they have to be doing hands-on lab activities. They could also be cognitively engaged. And so they, they could be thinking about what they're learning, maybe using a, a classroom polling technology like a clicker or, um, you know, if you're teaching high school and, and you're in virtual learning, maybe you're using other polling technologies, Kahoot or, or, you know, some other kind of system so that you can gauge where students are at and get them to participate a little bit more in the process. So there are some people who have tried to define what are the characteristics of active learning instruction. And uh, so some of the key ones are that students have to have the opportunity to share their ideas and the justifications for those ideas or their reasoning. Oftentimes this happens in small groups, either with, a, with another student as a pair or in, you know, maybe a group of three or four. Um, so collaborative learning and cooperative learning is a, is a big active learning strategy. And you also want to encourage, as part of active learning, you want to encourage students to be figuring things out on their own, constructing their own knowledge and making sense of it. So those are some of the key, you know, these might not be con as concrete, <laughs> concrete examples, but um, some things to think about with active learning. And the physics education community has a lot of curricula that have come out that are based on, you know, encouraging more interactive engagement in your classes. Things like interactive lecture demonstrations, tutorials and introductory physics, and lots of different curricula that you can, that you can use. All right, so I really wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, chapter six in the book because this is where I learned uh, some information that I didn't know before. Um, so there, there have been some studies recently that about student perceptions and when students sit in a lecture, they perceive that they are learning more. And so if you ask them, how much do you think you learned after sitting through this lecture, they will rate that they learned more than they, they learn if they're doing some kind of, um, you know, active learning activity. Maybe they're working with a group of students on, some, on something in the class. But if you measure their actual learning, giving them some like pre-post assessments, they're actually learning less from the lecture, even though they would say that they learned more. Um, so this, <laughs> this is, presents some challenges, I think, for us as instructors. Another thing that's really interesting is uh, there's some, been some research on common study strategies that students use. And so a lot of this is by John, John Dunlosky. Um, and this is, a, you know, a article, I think, in the American Educator. Um, it's written more you know, colloquially to be sort of for instructors. There's also a longer <laughs> article in the journal Psychological Science in the Public Interest where they go through uh, several different study strategies and um, which ones are, you know, more effective in terms of research findings, which ones are sort of promising but don't have a lot of research backing, and which ones are really, you know, not not particularly useful. They don't go as far as saying they're ineffective, but uh, not really having evidence to support them. So um, they go through at least 10 different strategies. And so you'll see uh, the most effective ones that they talk about are like practice testing. So have, students have to frequently kind of um, test their knowledge in order to see if they really understand it or not. Um, the idea of distributed practice is that you're spacing out your learning over time. Um, it's in <laughs> in comparison to what we call mass practice. Mass practice is like cramming and so we know students do it <laughs> and they know that they're just trying to pass a test or something like that. Um, and so maybe that is effective for them in the short term, but it isn't promoting long-term long learning and transfer to new situations. And so uh, mass practice, you know, we, we should encourage students not to just cram. <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to retain the information better if you space your learning out over time and practice, practice uh, you know, testing yourself. Um, so there are different ways, um, you know, some, strategies here that are kind of promising. There's a whole lot of research in support in support of them, but um, they're, they're promising. Interleaved practice um, has to do with kind of combining multiple um, topics or ideas in, 
when you're, when you're practicing. So I like to think of this in physics as like maybe you're not just going chapter by chapter and saying like, oh, I know how to solve these problems because they all have to do with linear kinematics in one dimension. Or I know all of these problems have to do with Newton's laws of motion. I'm not going to see anything, you know, from a previous chapter or something like that. So uh, interleaved is like maybe you have a combination of principles. It's like having a cumulative exam. You, you're kind of intermixing things so that students have to be able to identify which principles should I use here and and practice uh, knowing what conditions have to be in place in order to apply a part our particular principle and that's better for long term learning than just kind of segmenting things. Um, elaborative interrogation and self explanation um, kind of have to do with when you're when you're reading something in a in a textbook. Uh, or in your notes kind of asking yourself well why or how does that connect to things that I already know I'm trying to explain it in your own words and you know, just really thinking about it more deeply um, so contrary to popular belief from our students uh, just highlighting the textbook or your notes or underlining things doesn't really help your learning um, it might make you we call it like a, it's a feel-good strategy <laughs> it makes you feel like you're more familiar with the material um, that you're doing something when you're studying but really uh, it, it, you know, if you've ever looked at a textbook that students highlight, they highlight way too much. They, they have difficulty picking out what the important information is. And so it can be a starting point, um, but it's not really the most effective strategy. Also, just rereading the textbook or their notes isn't necessarily the best strategy either. You need to be actively in, engaging in that rereading process, maybe with uh, the inter elaborative interrogation or self-explanation pieces to it. Um, just summarizing as something, a summarization isn't necessarily a, a useful practice either, unless people are explicitly trained on how to summarize something um, and maybe uh, think more deeply about what they've read. Uh, I already kind of mentioned mass practice, so just trying to cram everything in a short amount of time, um, studying the same thing over and over and over again can be effective in the short term, but if you're looking at, um, you know, long-term learning it's not very uh, not very effective and then some of these other strategies like keyword mnemonics or trying to use imagery with the text you know trying to imagine things in terms of pictures or use um, you know like ways to help help you remember vocabulary or things like that um, might also be effective in the short term but it doesn't always stick all right, and then I also wanted to mention that as we're learning about perceptions and study strategies, um, there's a, a researcher named Bjork, Bjork at UCLA, and he's really kind of summarized this as you need to have desirable difficulties. And so some of these, you know, strategies that are less useful are pretty low level things for students to do. They don't require a lot of thought. And that's the problem. <laughs> in order to really learn something, you have to put in some effort. And so in the mathematics field, I think sometimes this is called productive struggle. And so students need to have a little bit of struggle with the material. Um, you can't just always jump in and tell them the answer. Um, if you have these desirable difficulties, it'll promote learning. So in, in that uh, student toolbox article that Dunlosky wrote, he identifies some tips for instructors. And so I've tried to summarize these tips here, um, but they're largely from that article. And so how can you encourage you know, that practice testing? You can give more formatives or low stakes quizzes, you know, asking students to continuously review the material, practice the material in your classes. You can encourage students to develop good study habits. What's your plan? Um, when are you going to study for the exam? Are, you know, start a week in advance and budget time in order to do that. You can also give some more you know, cumulative types of problems or exams that combine multiple topics and principles so that they're not just learning things in a very segmented way, but they have to think about the bigger picture of physics and what's involved. You can um, encourage students to be reading things actively you know questioning themselves like what did i just read about how does that connect to what i've learned before what do, what does this mean in my own words not just passively reading things and asking having them ask why you know why and does this make sense so mixing this idea of interleave practice to mixing content uh, old content with new content and then you know you can 
make students aware of some of these study strategies, which ones are effective, which ones are not as effective or not as useful, and tell them it's okay if you highlight. Just be aware <laughs> that that's only the beginning. Like it, it may not be actually the most effective way to promote your learning of the material. And so the testing effect uh, is kind of related to what I was talking about on the previous slide about study strategies. Um, but this research has shown that people who you know study something initially and then are tested have a greater long-term retention of the material than if a group of people were just studying the whole time. So, that, um, And even if the people who were tested didn't get feedback on whether or not their answers were correct, just the process of testing yourself promoted long-term retention of the material. Um, and so there's been several studies of this in the psychology field with like learning words and a series of words and, and stuff like that. Um, I think it's just starting to make its, its way into more content-based areas of research. I haven't really seen much in physics education yet, but I think um, it will be something that people kind of jump on and, and test out soon. Um, the other thing that comes out of this research on the testing effect is that um, the way that you test or the, <laughs> the information that you're testing to can make a difference. And so this probably isn't a surprise to someone who's been teaching for a while, but if you are requiring students to generate some knowledge or a, you know, a short answer response, uh, give you some indication of what they're thinking or justifying their understanding, that is going to promote more long lasting learning than if you're just requiring them to recognize something or identify something from a list, um, that kind of lower level recall stuff. And so the instructional strategies, you know, I talked about a lot of these in the Dunlowski tips and stuff, like maybe you do frequent, frequent testing or formatives, your practice, having them do practice testing, uh, maybe some cumulative types of cumulative types of exams or problem solving so that they can you know be doing some some practice with uh, with the the, uh, the material so that they're actually testing themselves and taking it seriously and not just you know sort of rereading things um, and developing a sense of familiarity with the material all right so in the book we we have a few concluding remarks um, and I didn't, I, I didn't go into detail about everything in the book, but one thing that we also talk about is some of the challenges of implementing ideas in terms of reformed instruction. And in the book, we call these evidence-based instructional practices or EBIPs. You can also call them like RBIS, research-based instructional strategies, especially at the college level. Um, you know, sometimes there are situational factors that affect whether or not, you know, somebody will try out a new way of teaching in their classroom and there's a lot of I don't know inertia <laughs> to just keep doing what you're doing or to to keep doing things more traditionally and so we need to change that culture we need to be supportive of people who want to try new things in their classroom and we need to be basing our teaching on evidence of what works for student learning um, so my, our, my second point here is that teaching really is a scholarly activity. It's, I mean, certainly as you become more experienced in your teaching, and you you have anecdotal things that work for you. Um, and some people say teaching is an art, but really you should be starting with what we know as evidence of student learning. What are some of the things that will, will be most effective for student learning? Try some of those out in your classroom and then you know, treat this as a scholarly activity, scholarship of teaching and learning. Collect data on whether or not that was effective in your situation. And don't just try it once <laughs> because sometimes it takes a few times, um, but collect data with regard to student learning in your class and then refine the process. Maybe that didn't work as well as you thought it would. You know, Try out a different strategy um, and hopefully you know, I've given you a few ideas today, um, but also certainly in the book, we review some new instructional strategies that are based on physics education research, but also psychology, the learning sciences, education psychology. And so we can draw from a lot of different areas um, about what we know about student learning, but ultimately this, this is something that should be based on research. 
welcome. I'm delighted to see everyone. We have a uh, wonderful speaker here who I hope you've all seen because the whole purpose of these meetings is to have a discussion rather than a presentation. So we've literally flipped the meeting. Uh, you watched uh, our speaker, Jennifer Doctors, talk. I was happy to see lots of questions. I, I printed some out here, although I think I won't need to read them off because I see many of the people who post the questions here online. Um, so we have about an hour. We'll, we'll put a, a firm stop at noon, which means we have uh, more time than we usually had for uh, discussion. And I'm sure our speaker will, will be more than happy to continue to have the asynchronous discussion in perusal or by any other means that you want. So Jennifer Doctor, our speaker, is a professor at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. She has a long um, career in doing physics education research. She did her PhD at the University of Minnesota with Ken Heller, I presume, right, uh, Jennifer? Yep, yep, I was Ken, Ken and Heller. Patricia Heller on problem solving. I'm a, I'm a, a great fan of Ken's context rich problem and his, uh, you know, very nicely organized. I think it was seven steps to, uh, to, uh, to problem solving. She recently co authored a book with Jose Mestre uh, on the science of learning physics, which was the subject of uh, her talk. And um, Jennifer, we're absolutely delighted to have you here. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna you know, kick this off with a burning question I have. And uh, if you have any questions, two things you can do. You can put the question in the uh, chat, but even better, you can use that reactions button at the bottom. Uh, Zoom moved raising a hand from the participant list to the reactions. So, so you can just raise your hand like that. If you still have the old version of, I'm gonna lower my hand. If you still have the older version of Zoom, the raise hand button is at the bottom of the, uh, of the participant list. And if none of that works, you can just unmute yourself and, um, and, uh, and ask your question verbally. I do ask that you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit where, where you're teaching. Okay, so my first question had to do with your discussion, Jennifer, of um, uh, in chapter six of perception and study strategies. And the thing that immediately came to mind when I, when I, when I heard you say the word study strategies was assessment. After all, the assessment that we use is primarily responsible for driving student study behavior. And in recent years, I've, I've started to really think a lot about, about assessment, in part by observing my own daughter be a student at Harvard. And in spite of all of the advice I gave her on study strategies, I found out that she used study strategies that I didn't think were compatible with the type of learning that I wanted. And I asked her about it and she said, well, you know, I need to find a way to pass this exam. So, so I think that, that, and I would like to hear your opinion about this. I think that to a large degree, it is the assessment that drives students' behavior. They're very strategic and we would be just as strategic. I know that for a fact, because sometimes to you know, renew my IRB, I have to do, some kind of uh, online testing. And there again, unfortunately, most of the testing is at a very low level of Bloom's taxonomy, remembering things. And it struck me that in, in the strategies that you discussed, most of them, and I was then later further reinforced by the, the work you cited by uh, Roddy Reidinger and, uh, and uh, I think it's Michael Karpicke, um, you know, they were very much focused on, on the lower level Bloom's taxonomy rather than the higher level skills that we really want our students in general at all levels, I think, K-12 and higher ed uh, to, to develop. So shouldn't we be thinking about totally rethinking our approaches to assessment and move away 
from the lowest level thinking skills. After all, when in your own talk, you started by saying, you know, you, I forgot which question it was that you asked at the beginning of the term and the end of the term. Oh yes, it was whether all metals are magnetic or not, right? Um, so you forget facts, but if you really understand the underlying physics, then maybe it's easier to, to remember. So shouldn't we really be rethinking our approaches to assessment? All right, there's <laughs> a lot of things embedded in that question, but um, yeah, I agree that your assessment will drive, um, you know, what students focus on and the study strategies they use. I mean, when I reflect on my own college experience, I do remember doing a lot of like, you write flashcards and like kind of test yourself but a lot of that is very low level skills like you said is just trying to memorize something um, trying to remember you know some definition or something like that uh, and even yeah a lot of the the ones that were mentioned in that Denlosky article about just highlighting um, maybe it helps you build some familiarity with the material and these strategies might be effective in the short term for cramming and for uh, remembering um, to you know enough information to pass the test, but if you know the the things you mentioned about the testing effect, uh, they see that for long term retention, uh, it's not going to be effective. But you also mentioned that what we really want students to be gaining is these higher level skills, <laughs> and um, so so I think that in that respect, uh, the the assessment can certainly drive those higher level skills, if, if you want them to be gaining problem solving skills, you actually have to assess them on, on the problem solving steps and you know, process that, um, that you hope they're engaging in. So you have to reinforce that process and not just the final answer. Um, so certainly if you're doing problem solving in your physics classes, you want to be emphasizing the process because that's part of those skills. Um, but also, I know bef before we got online, online here, we were talking about some project-based learning kind of things. And so if you're assessing students in that kind of way, you know, thinking more broadly about assessment, um, not just in taking a test, but maybe engaging in some kind of project or group project um, where students actually have to sort of do some research to figure out uh, what they need to use to be able to, um, to complete that project or, or something like that. I can. I think you can maybe build some of those higher level skills. You know, just by by giving them something that's uh, you know not as cut and dry as answering a, dir a direct question. Um, something where they have to kind of try and figure out, or some kind of engineering design type of question where they have to um, come up with something on on their own. I think that can certainly you know build some of those higher level skills too. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with that. And also, I think that one of the things that we all deep down realize uh, is that what, uh, you know, if you think about the traditional assessment approaches that are used around the world, maybe not so much in this group, because we are a group of people who are all interested in, in, in the cognitive underpinnings of learning and in, in research. But if, if you, uh, if you think about the standard approach an exam where you isolate people from each other, where you isolate them from any source of information, I mean, that's not how society works. I mean, in our, in our daily lives, we don't have exams the, the way we give them in, uh, in education from K through 12 to college to graduate school. So um, I think it'd be much better if we, assess people the way they got assessed in society, there would be a much better connection. Um, so I encourage in the chat, but I don't know if people saw it, please raise your hand. I, I know there are many unanswered questions. I was looking, I was looking at uh, perusal and there are still a lot of unanswered questions. I can, I can read them off, but it'd be much better if the people who asked them uh, raise their hands and ask them themselves. So, Elmarie Mortimer is putting in the chat, I've been thinking a lot about skills. And the question is, how do we test skills? I guess you have to um, first sort of define what, what skills you want to see um, your students. Yeah, I, I, I see uh, Donna is um, saying performance assessments in there. 
um, rubrics. Yeah, I guess some people have some ideas too. Um, formative assessment. Yeah, it could also be testing skills. But yeah, I mean, I, I my brain always goes to problem solving skills. But there's other kind of skills that um, sometimes I think people are are focused on it at the middle school and high school level, like uh, being able to work as a team or in a group. Um, you know, note taking skills. There's all kinds of skills that you need for <laughs> for learning that aren't just um, skills pertaining to the content. Um, but also, I think if if your school <clears throat> is focused on the next generation science standards, um, you you're probably familiar with the scientific practices to the eight scientific practices in the next generation science standards. And so um, I've recently been focused focusing on scientific explanations with my future elementary school teachers class and having students um, learn how to construct scientific explanations using claim evidence and reasoning frameworks and then um, so that they can use that in their future classroom. So I think that for me, um, maybe skills is kind of a broad term, um, but I like the way that the Next Generation Science Standards outlines these eight different practices that people need to learn in science, like asking questions, developing and using models, um, you know, constructing scientific explanations, um, analyzing and interpreting data, um, and so uh, planning and carrying out investigations. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I I would recommend if you're not familiar with those to look at those too and then and maybe helping students to develop those skills and then I, I think the question of assessment is much harder though how do we assess students ability to plan and carry out an investi investigation um, and I think that's where um, maybe there's still some work to be done and and guidance on that but you're you're all te <laughs> teachers too so maybe you can share some ideas of how you assess skills in your classes too. I would love to hear that. So I'm always looking for novel ideas of assessment. Does anybody have anything to, um, to share here? And you know, that way, I don't know if people saw two days ago, the cover article uh, on Forbes, about Chegg, it's now a $12 billion company, bigger than any publisher. And let me tell you, I think this is the end of textbooks as we know it, and also of uh, testing services, testing. I mean, a lot of the, the, the practice that we do are now completely undermined by, uh, by Chegg. We, I see some hands up, great. Um, Elizabeth, um, I wanna turn it over to you. Please introduce yourselves. Okay. Um, so I'm Elizabeth England. I teach physics at Winnesquam Regional High School in Tilton, New Hampshire. Right now it's in the negatives, so we would like it a little warmer. So anyone in warmer states, send us warm weather. Um, my big challenge as a teacher is the students are not great at taking notes. And so I've spent a lot of time working on that skill with students to the point that I just started using um, Rocketbook for them to take notes because I talk a lot about that actually writing the notes out is really important. Um, I said, and there are tons of studies if you wanna read them. Um, but what I just started doing near the end of the last semester is I had the students take ownership of their notes and teach how they take notes. So there's definitely a correlation between the grade you get in my honors physics class and the ability for you to take really great notes. Um, so I had the kids teach other kids how to teach the notes. And so that's kind of, I'm trying to get them to take ownership over their skills. That's it. Hey, Elizabeth, are you assessing the note-taking skill in your um, assessment? I. What I do is I actually, um, they have to turn in their science notebook at the end of the semester, um, a week before final, a week before the end of the semester. And then I look it over and I do it, we have, um, I do it, I assess it under the science and engineering practices. Um, as I do it as a habit grade for our school because we have habit grades and so, um, and our habit grades are actually put on their great, on their, um, report cards. So 
it's a way to get them to make really good habits. Um, I would love to make it a grade that goes in the grade book it, as an actual grade, but there's been pushback by administration. So I just make it a habit grade. So I see still quite a few hands up. Uh, let's see, I think uh, Robert had his hand up first. So you're, and then Dot and then Jennifer Marsher. Hi everyone, I'm from New York. It's cold, it's not quite that cold, but <laughs> I feel you. Um, I was just thinking about the, the idea of assessment and what you said about Chegg and something that popped up in our school now is the app, I think it's called Show Math. Uh, which is you basically just pummeled the entire mathematics curriculum across the board. Um, and being a former student that used to find those paths of easiness, I kind of find humor in it um, because it just shows like if an app can do what we're expecting them to do, you know, are we really teaching them what we want them to learn? Um, and so one thing that I do to assess my kids, I actually have the kids write the assessment. So I give them, you know, here's what I want you to come up with, maybe a free response question. Um, I want you to hit these couple things and you need to make it at a level that, you know, if it's an AP class, an AP level student should be able to solve it, but they should struggle with it. And so I have the kids create the question and then they give it to another group and the other group attempts to solve the question, but also grades them on their ability to write the question. So is there anything missing? Is it solvable? Um, you know, does it make sense? Stuff like that. And so they can't go somewhere to really find the questions because they're the ones who are coming up with it. Um, and it does eat a bit of time. It probably takes about four periods to do but I find that the kids get so engaged in trying to make these problems, you know, oh, we have, all, we gotta have all these little nuances so that our friends can't quite solve it, but we still wanna make it solvable. And it's this kind of competition that comes up. Um, and I found that that's, it's worked well this year because it just removes some of that kind of other testing anxiety that comes with it because it's not, you know, a multiple choice test or something like that. It's something that they're creating and it, to them, it seems more like a puzzle than necessarily, you know, questions, even though I see it as exactly the same thing, you know, that's, so that's something we tried or I tried and um, I've enjoyed it. They've enjoyed it. And it comes out to be about the same product. You know, the strong kids are still doing kind of the expectation that they would have and the weaker kids are, are now seeking out more help in that kind of group environment. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, let's see, Dot, you were next, I think, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so our discussion about like how you assess skills made me think about one of my colleagues in my modeling methods course. Hi, Scott, hi, Jeremy. Um, and his name is um, Brandon Van Bibber. And at his school, he shared this with me his science department collectively all across like the different types of science fields have agreed on at least for this semester or this year being virtual for um, science practices from NGSS that they agree to assess a minimum of three times over the course of a semester. So repeatedly. Um, and what's nice about that is then they can see kids progress on those same um, practices throughout the year. And what's really neat is that I think he based his practices rubric off of Marizano's standards based grading resources. And they were very, very clear about the terminology they used for the practices they wanted, like constructing explanations and arguments. Um, they reworked some of the NGSS standards to make them more specific. And they actually give this really detailed rubric to their students. I mean, based on what the pro project or assignment's asking of them. And then they go through a process of making sure students understand it thoroughly, which I think is really cool because um, I could see students progress over the semester and students understand expectations. So I wanna try to implement that in my class. 
So let's return to questions. I want to be sure that we also have a, a chance to ask questions of uh, Jennifer Doctor, who is here specifically to address some questions. And there was one in the chat that I want to be sure we address. Uh, oh, it scrolled off again from uh, Mariana uh, Ruggiero. Um, Ruggiero, pardon me. Um, who is wondering if there's any evidence. Oh, Mariana, you want to ask your question? Yeah, I have all my kiddos with me. <laughs> um, That's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, but in, so in the book, we talk a lot about like where misconceptions come from and how it's, you know, from, from students kind of previous experience with the world. And I was wondering if there's, if there's any evidence that relates um, whether or not that shifts based on their experience with physics at yeah. the elementary level. Um, I think traditionally a lot of elementary teachers oh. avoid or ignore the physics aspect. It's in their um, education courses because they're scared of it or they don't have um, experience. So, in, and, and I, I think it's neat, you, you work with elementary teachers. So does that, is there any evidence that, that getting that at that younger age kind of supports the whole, the whole chain there? You mean um, working with the teachers and then how that influences their students too? Is that kind of like, like, what, so, or? If, so if students are getting a stronger base in physics, a lot of times students really don't get a, you know, any kind of physics until their physics concepts until maybe middle school, definitely not until, you know, until high school. So like when, when they have a stronger foundation in just, just doing that, ex exploring type work in physics um, for things, because looking brother, at, right? look at, you know, looking at how things fall, you know, that being the big example that everything falls at the same rate, that's something you could do at a younger age. Mm -hmm. And, sure. you know, so if that's robust at the elementary level, does that have any influence on misconceptions when you're looking at the high school, you know, yeah, or upper school. levels? Or is that still strictly like kind of like disconnected? Like if they haven't gotten it in that schooling experience, they're still going to have those misconceptions because they don't necessarily transfer that information. Yeah, and I'm not as familiar with the research at that, you know, at the elementary levels, but I think they're even in like uh, Rosalind Driver's book on, on um, misconceptions and stuff too. I think they do talk a little bit about research that's been done at the elementary level and the ideas that that kids have at those levels, you know, elementary, middle school do often propagate. But um, I don't know if any if so many people have done like longitudinal studies looking at if if you can make a difference at the at those younger ages and give them more experiences with physical science. How does that impact, you know, what, you know, their what they know and and can do at the middle school and high school levels i think that would be a really interesting question i was part of a um, i've had a couple of grants through the mathematics and science partnerships programs and so some of the there are some grant-based projects that looked at giving professional development in stem to elementary and middle school teachers and and then they you know implement that with their students and and do see gains in the, in the student learning and things like that. So there are some some you know grant based programs that have looked at what the the teachers content knowledge does influence um, the student learning. And so it is important for us to be you know working with our elementary school teacher colleagues too. Um, but certainly you know, I would I would expect that it would carry on. Um, but then, I don't know, misconceptions are really hard and difficult sometimes, and they have to be exposed to them multiple times in order for for really conceptual change to happen. Um, you know, I see this sometimes with even uh, floating and sinking. My students have a lot of ideas that aren't quite right, and sometimes I think they still, my college students still think that heavier objects will sink <laughs> all the time and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it's that's a great question. Um, hopefully more people will do some longitudinal research to see how the, how the earlier grades do influence what they can do later on. Great. We have, we have more and more hands popping up. Uh, be sure to, to introduce yourself and tell us where you, where you teach. Uh, Jennifer Mosher, you're next. Hi, I teach high school at Morristown Friends School in Morristown, New Jersey. Um, and my question is about frequent low stakes testing. 
because I've heard before that that's useful for kids and I was surprised that even without much feedback it's useful. So I was wondering because my instructional time is so reduced this year. Um, do you have any is there any research about the timing of those tests? Can they be done out of class? Do they have to be done in class? Like, does it matter when they happen? No, I mean, I think that the information on the testing effects, um, which was not done with more, you know, more complex materials, uh, said that if you want um, the testing effect to be effective for the long-term retention, um, it's usually, you know, things are sp spaced out in terms of days and weeks, um, but, but yeah, I don't know, you know, the frequent, frequent testing, how, <laughs> what's the, what's the sweet spot, I guess, is maybe the question of like, you know, how often should students be assessing the, their own learning? And, and I think that, um, you know, if you're building those metacognitive skills with your students too, anytime that they read information or that they're trying to learn something, they should be questioning themselves, does this make sense? Um, and sort of, you know, what did I just read? So having that kind of dialogue with themselves. So there's, those aren't necessarily low stakes tests, but even like continuing to, to question themselves and make sure that they understand it. But then, yeah, I'm not sure if it's like uh, every, once a week at least, you know, having them kind of reflect on what did, what did they learn and does it make sense to them and, and giving them some questions to make sure that they're assessing, you know, sort, sort of low stakes things, assessing whether or not they um, really understood the material or not. Um, I'm not sure, maybe some other people have ideas about how often, but I think that like weekly, um, you know, weekly little quizzes might be a good time frame. Could it be done out of class? Do I have to do them in class? I think you just want students to be taking them seriously. So that's why maybe attaching a small, you know, low stakes is maybe attaching a small amount of, of points or something to it so that they are taking it seriously and not just, um, I think that's another thing with practice testing is that you want students to treat it like it's a real assessment of their learning and not just sort of, eh, I'll just try it. And if I don't get it right, that it's not a, not a big deal. I mean, you want to want to have this balance between they do take it serious enough to sort of really uh, assess their learning and see what they do and do not know. Um, but you don't want to have so many points that they're, you're creating anxiety about it too. So that's what the issue is with high stakes testing. So I, I, I I don't know that there's any research about whether, you know, whether to do it in class or outside of class. I don't think that would matter so much unless you really wanted to, you know, make sure students are taking it seriously in order to have it, you know, be watching them, I guess, to, to make sure that they're actually um, doing it. And, and sometimes it's useful for them to try something out without using their notes. I think the issue with online learning too is oftentimes students are just sort of looking everything up, relying on their notes. Um, and and that's okay to some extent, but you know, if you really want to see if they're retaining some of the information on their own, um, maybe they sh should try it out without having a whole, trying to explain it in their own words without having a bunch of resources at their disposal that they're just gonna recite or copy. Thank you, <clears throat> Jennifer. We have uh, another three hands that went up, Jolene, then Scott, then Philippe Bon. Please introduce yourself briefly. Hi, I'm Jolene. I'm in Minneapolis. I went to grad school with Dr. Doctor. Um, so my question is, um, we, so during COVID, we don't have a lot of time for professional development. And I'm trying to figure out how to get some of my science department who take a lot of the traditional teaching, like lecture, kids do traditional problems without a lot of like support, but just like figure out little math problems. Um, what is what one thing out of all the great things in your book would you say would be like the best idea if I can only get them to do one change in their teaching practice? Right now I have to <laughs> I have to pick a favorite strategy or something. I think that's really hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to uh, gravitate towards maybe one, maybe there's a couple that are at the top. Um, and certainly we've been talking a lot about like formative assessment techniques and things like that. So I think that um, if they could implement something, um, you know, where they're asking students to uh, maybe even some sort of multiple choice clicker types of questions or something where students have to think about a conceptual question, come to an answer, discuss it with their peers, and then, um, you know, give some justification for why they chose that answer. Um, I think that's a, 
you know, even a think pair share, those are some things that are pretty easy, easy to implement into a classroom if you're not doing that already, just to increase the student engagement. And uh, so it's not just pure lecture and, you know, doing problems and stuff like that. The other thing that I really, you know, like to emphasize, and I haven't seen implemented as much with my colleagues as I would like, is how to teach problem solving. Um, so really encouraging your students to draw a picture, write down, you know, some symbols for quantities, just showing all the steps in your process, not just going right away to what equation do I need to use and writing down things that they, you know, they're just trying to match um, some symbols or something like that. They're not really thinking about what are the deeper underlying physics concepts and principles that I want to use in this question. So there's a lot of things in terms of the way that you teach problem solving that I think can also emphasize the process a little bit more than just getting an answer or just doing these very straightforward types of problems. Um, I think that um, those are, I guess those are my top, <laughs> would be some more like um, student engagement with like formative assessment types of techniques and then uh, really being deliberate about the way that you teach problem solving. I like that. It's definitely one of the things that uh, we're trying very hard in, in my classroom to do, to, to do as well, to structure problem solving and get away from plug and chug. Um, let's see, Scott, you're next. Hello, I'm Scott. I, I actually teach chemistry, but I minored in physics and I've taught it before and I was invited by a physicist. So um, anyway, uh, my question is kind of similar to the last two, but I hope it's a little different. So I run into a, an issue where I have a substantial number of teachers that I interact with um, both in my district or on social media who've kind of found this like simplicity to assessment. Like they think it's easy because they've kind of locked into like retrieval practice and I just do retrieval practice and I do this simple, you know, this and it works. Um, have you found anything productive at kind of getting through to teachers that like, no, it's supposed to be hard and like it's multifaceted and it's not just you do retrieval practice and you space it out and you do these simple tasks, but like, how do you, how do you get people to buy into this? We're going to do difficult, creative thinking, problem solving, that kind of narrative. I don't know. Does that make sense? Well, I think you have to get buy-in from the instructors and you have to get buy-in from your students, which is, is very challenging to, um, because so often I think our students too, they just want to, you know, copy down whatever you're saying in a lecture and do these simple retrieval practice kinds of things or, or rote memorization. I mean, getting students to buy in um, is just as hard as getting the, the teachers and faculty to buy into that idea too. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's uh, some good research on, on how to do that. I guess how to sort of emphasize that these com more complex skills and, and making it difficult um, will be beneficial for, for, for learning, I guess. Um, and certainly there's this idea, I've heard it in math called like productive struggle. Um, and I think uh, there's another uh, cognitive guy, maybe Bjork, who talks about, it was something about difficulties, uh, desirable difficulties in your classroom. I think we mentioned that in the book too. But yeah, how to get people to buy into that idea that it should be a little bit more challenging. I don't know if I if I have a good resource <laughs> on that, um, but I think starting with, uh, yeah, I don't know, like making sure that you're addressing those difficulties with students and also trying to communicate to them why are we doing it this way, um, and not you know not another way, like kind of saying like, well, I really want you to um, to learn this material, and you know, research shows that by doing it this way, you'll be able to learn the material better or some, some, some way to sort of communicate to your students the importance of, of the way that you're teaching your class to promote better learning might be able, may, might be one way to help too. But if you, yeah, trying to reach teachers or colleagues, I, I don't, that's a challenging one too. Um, I'm seeing some things in the chat. So maybe some other people have ideas about how to do that, how to, um, sort of convince people of the value, I guess, of doing things that are not always easy. Is anybody else who wants to comment before we go to Philippa and then Maksuda who has raised her hands a few times, but I guess it's automatically lowered again. So um, she will go next. But before that, let's stick with the current topic. 
any other suggestions? There's some, um, yes, loss and uh, Lawson's test, which I have applied a number of times in my class too, which is a great general test of critical thinking. And I saw the FCI, there are a number of other really good uh, instruments. Okay, well, let's turn to Filippo. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Filippo, I'm, I'm a physics teacher in Italy. Uh, I was um, very curious about what you just talked about, the, the desirable difficulties. Uh, because um, I know that my students struggle with, problem, with physics problems, but they are also very interested in how to solve problems. And as a teacher, I don't know what is the right level of difficulty that I can put inside my problem. And so I, um, they want, as, a, as my students want to achieve, for, and I also want to then make them familiar with these little kind of difficulties. And so I don't know if you have any uh, idea or tip how to, to build a problem so that is not too difficult for them, but they can, you know, I could be the, I, to engage the students in this in the process of finding the solution, right? And so to make those difficulties more desirable you know, in this sense. I know if you get my point. Do you, ever, do you ever have students work on problems in a group? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because so I think that. Yeah, sometimes if they're in a group, and if you structure those groups, um, you know, ap appropriately, that I think that sometimes they're capable of doing more difficult problems in a group than they would be doing them individually. So that's one way to, you know, maybe have something that's a little bit more challenging. Um, you could probably give it to a group of students, and they would be able to come up with some ideas together, um, rather than just having people work on things individually. I think you can uh, give them a little bit more challenging questions in a group. At least that's, I think some of the research from University of Minnesota showed that too. Um, but yeah, I think finding that, <laughs> that um, you know, the appropriate level so that students can have enough success with the problem solving that, you know, they feel good about it and aren't just completely going to shut down and get frustrated. I think that's, that can be challenging. You want to give them, you know, something that's not too challenging, but at that at that right level, I think that's I think that's hard. I I think sometimes textbooks tend to tend to structure things at the end of the chapter where they have these exercises, which are just super like <laughs> plug and chug types of things, and so it doesn't really make students go through that process of trying to figure out a solution to a problem. And so um, sometimes I don't always like that, that structure that the textbooks sometimes have exercises and then they have problems. I you know I'm. I feel like maybe a few exercises are okay to just see how it applies and, and they get some success with it, but then really to build the skills that you wanna see in problem solving, it needs to be a little bit more challenging so that they have to make decisions. I think that's that's the key thing with a, with a good problem is that students have to make decisions. They have to decide, you know, um, what kinds of concepts and principles they're going to use on the question, how to, how to structure my picture, what's going on in the question, trying to interpret it so that it's not just a clear, clear cut thing that maybe they have to read it and make some de decisions about it and then go through a, go through the process of solving it. Um, so yeah, I don't, <laughs> I think as an instructor, you have to figure out where your students are at. That's one of the challenges, I think, of, of teaching is that you have to kind of figure out where your students are at um, and how you can you know, give them something that's, that's going to be at an appropriate level for them and you know, make sure that they do have some success with it so that they uh, will want to continue and be motivated to continue on it. But if, yeah. if anyone has some other ideas or resources, I certainly... <laughs> yeah, well... I'm in. Well, I can I can share that in AP 50 um, in Eric's class. One of the things that is central to the course is you know project based learning and students working in teams. And one of the ways that we structure this work is many of the assignments or the tasks they do in class happen in two stages. And the first stage is an individual stage that the student where the student has to execute or problem solve on on their own. 
And then the second stage, um, once this has been completed, the students come together and work on this as a whole. Um, if Eric has a, wants to provide more details um, that might be relevant for this conversation, I think that would be that would be great. Um, but I think that's one way to to approach this. Well, I can, I can just add that I think it's really important with any group work that there's an individual responsibility too, because you, what you want to prevent is, is students from, you know, just sitting in on the sidelines and not really, uh, not, not really contributing. Um, so to get credit for what you're doing, and I use specifications grading, look that up if you're interested. It's, it's a great alternative between a narrative evaluation, a multi-dimensional narrative evaluation, and the need to produce a grade, which is much less meaningful at the end of the semester. Um, so in order to, to, to meet specifications on, on that given unit, they, they need to be, they need to have demonstrated effort on the individual part and um, participated and reflected uh, during the uh, during the team part. Um, so, Maksuda, before we forget, unless there's anybody else who wants to uh, react to Filippo's uh, question, um, because Maksuda was having trouble, was raising her hand. I saw her at the top of, and then all of a sudden she disappeared and then went back. So, before I forget, uh, Maksuda, let me turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Um, sorry, I don't have my video on today. It's just been crazy in the morning. So I'm Maxuda and I teach um, IB physics in Chavez High School, which is in Houston. So a couple of comments and then I actually have a question for you. So first question or comment is um, assessments. What I do is like I, the kids take the assessment individually and then they take the same assessment as a group because that's the time when they're most motivated to try to say that their answer is correct, right? So I feel like the assessment no longer works as just an assessment tool. It also works as a learning tool. And each group is like, like one answer, right? And then their total assessment grade becomes a combination. Like the way they fight at that moment, because they know their grades depend on it, but they know that they want to be correct. Um, for engagement, I actually get my students to ask, I ask them how they feel about my class every six weeks. And I had students telling me that it was, Initially, they were like, it's virtual. We don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I switched to Pear Deck. That's something our district has bought. If anybody has not used it, I will highly recommend using Pear Deck, um, but being careful that it's not used as a PowerPoint style because Pear Deck can be very PowerPointy. Um, on the other hand, it can be every single slide can be interactive. And we do teams. So I um, combine Pear Deck with breakout rooms. So on my pair deck, I might ask a question. Um, how would you solve this particular question given the steps? Pair deck actually has a way to write, draw, or do multiple choice, handwriting. It has all of those inbuilt into it. I'll give them five minutes of breakout room, random. When they come back, they have to explain that to me. So they get to also know each other more, which for them has been a life changer. Like, oh my God, I actually know my student, like my colleagues now. Just some comments. Here's my question to you. What if you have a student in your class who is above everybody else um, and the other students start to complain about that? How do you deal with that? Because I literally had a student tell me, I know I'm never going to be number one, so I don't even know what's the use of trying anymore because the particular student is, just knows things. Like the student just has, is much quicker, right? At understanding all these things. So how do you, like, how do you deal with something like that? Whether it's assessments, because students sometimes just decide to forget, because I give extra credit if they're quick at being able to answer something in a cognitive pro proper way. How would you deal with that? Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer to your question. <laughs> Certainly, um, you know, the, there are challenges with you've got a know it all in your classroom who wants to answer everything, or you've got somebody who, you know, the other students sort of feel like, oh, well, this person just gets it and I, I, I must be stupid, I don't get it right away or something like that. I think it, it, that classroom culture is really challenging and that positive learning environment is really difficult to establish at the beginning of your course. Um, and, and I think that ideally you would like that person who knows the answer to be 
you know, sort of helping other people in the class and not, not being as, I don't know, arrogant about what they know or something like that, but it yeah. doesn't, doesn't always happen yeah. like that. Um, you know, you would really people. want, right? But the what class, was that? It helps everybody, but the class is super competitive. So that's become the challenge, right? Because it's a super competitive class. Um, it's my IB class, which means the students already know their physics. Um, so in spite of the student trying to help everybody, in spite, that is almost like, why are you helping us? We can do this by ourselves. Um, has anybody ever encountered a classroom like that where they have this super helpful, smart student it can be nice to have some stretch questions at the end where there's more than 100 points, but you max out the grade at 100 points. You can also have some more open-ended like cards you can give those students and have those prepared. And I, I read the comment, I was like, okay, what am, I don't know what to do with this. But so, so I'm very eager to comment here for two reasons. First of all, I use um, the two-stage the two I mean, uh, Isa already alluded to that when she talked about the, our approach to problem solving, but everything in the class is individual then together, including, including all of the, the assessments. So, and I, I couldn't agree more with your remark that, that um, you know, assessment should be a learning opportunity. However, what I found, you know, especially with my type of students at, a, at a, an institution like Harvard, which tends to be competitive, is that I need to make sure that no one can ace the individual part. In other words, I, if I were to give a curriculum developed for individual students to teams, the whole process would derail because I'd get exactly into the trouble that you mentioned. So the first thing I did when I switched from non-team-based to team-based learning was I jacked up the level of difficulty significantly. Groups of people can solve harder problems than individuals. So that means that even the best student in the class may only be able to answer 60% of the, of the questions. And, uh, you know, I, I have to, I, it's, it, this is a very tough pill to swallow for Harvard students because they've always been at, at, you know, at the top of their class and now all of a sudden discover that they can't answer everything. And if they get 90%, they, they, they consider themselves a failure and here they're getting 60% on a, on, a, on a series of questions. And I have to tell them, look, you know, you, you, need, to, you need to leave room for improvement. So that, that takes some hand-holding and, and setting the stage. Um, and then you find that other students start, question, start questioning the, the, the stronger student because they very quickly discover that even the best student in the class is not able to answer all questions uh, correctly. And then, and then another thing, even in the case that you get a student to is nearly all, let's say, questions. We know from our own experience who learns the most in any classroom. Who is that? Who is the person in any classroom who learns the most? Teacher. The teacher, exactly. So I think the diversity in, 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 in knowledge level and background is actually a plus because it permits the better students from teaching the students who are not at the same level as they are. And it's really a win-win situation. It's not that the weaker students learn at the expense of the better students. No, everybody gets raised because you put in a sense, the better students in the role of the teacher trying to verbalize his or her own understanding, which in a, as we know from our own experience teaching is a way of reinforcing your learning and, and finding gaps in your own understanding. So I, uh, I, I, I think you, you, you can take that as a positive, but you have to leave room at the top, I think. And somebody, somebody put that in the, uh, in, the, in the chat. I thought that was, we have another seven minutes left. There was one other hand up or, or not. I, 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 there's one question from the um, from um, perusal that I would love to hear the answer to. And unfortunately, I don't remember who asked that question. I was trying to quickly look it up, but I'm very bad at talking and listening at the same time. But someone, and, and as soon as I find it, I will 
uh, put it in the chat, but I, 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 want, I don't know if you saw that question, uh, Jennifer. Um, and, and this refers back to, I think you're the chapter two in your book and, and, and you mentioned there the hammer and the feather video, right? That the, the hammer and the feather uh, drop at the same time in a, in a vacuum. And this person, and unfortunately I don't have the name here, wrote students reaction I collected about the hammer and feather video was, it is not true or quote, unquote, it is fake, or another quote here, there's something wrong. These are very strong beliefs. How to help students to build their knowledge, not on what they believe is true. And you know, I was reflecting on that statement, and um, to some degree, we know from daily life experience that it isn't true, right? I, I drop a sheet of paper and a physics textbook, and physics textbook hit the floor earlier. It's only in a vacuum that, that the two hit the ground at the same time, but we don't live in a vacuum. <laughs> we live in an atmosphere. We wouldn't be able to live in a vacuum. So, so it's the whole underlying model. But to some degree, I have to agree with the student. It isn't true. They don't fall at the same rate in the planet. So what would your answer be to uh, this person's question? And I'll look up who it is so I can give credit to where the credit belongs. Yeah, I mean, I saw somebody also mention that there's a really great video, a Brian Cox video, where they go into a large vacuum chamber and they drop a bowling ball in a feather. And I've used that in class too, but yeah, I don't, <laughs> I mean, certainly students have to, um, sometimes students decomp, you know, put their knowledge into compartments and say, well, in a physics class, this is how I'm supposed to answer, but, and really, I believe this. And I think that's a challenge too, is that, um, you know, Sometimes we're trying to, you know, teach them things that are are in a, you know, not necessarily realistic situation of what, what there is consistent with their experience and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think that does present some challenges with, uh, you know, trying to introduce people to scientific conceptions and the way that scientists think about the world, um, but it may not be consistent with the way that they think about the world. Um, I, I've certainly seen uh, things like bridging analogies. You know, if somebody believes that um, passive objects cannot exert a force, like you have something sitting on the table, um, that table, there's no way it can exert a force back on that object because it's not alive, it's not living. Um, uh, I think John Clement did some things called bridging analogies where maybe you have, um, you know, like a, think about the uh, being on a board instead of being on a flat table. And so it's got, you know, a little bit of elasticity to it or having something on, on your hand there, you know, kind of building up multiple situations where people have to think about um, maybe what's going on at the molecular level and thinking about it almost like as, a, a, you know, little springs and things like that. So I, I don't, I don't know, there may be some strategies for getting, you know, students to sort of, uh, makes baby steps <laughs> towards, you know, thinking about the world and from a, um, you know, a more scientific perspective. Um, maybe they don't make it all the way to, <laughs> um, to thinking exactly, you know, what, what we expect. Um, maybe it ends up being some combination of, well, in this situation, this is what I'm going to observe, but in, you know, the true physics situation, this is what's going on. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, no, I guess exactly what your question was or what you wanted me to comment on, but I think that it's really difficult to get students to, um, you know, sort of change their conceptions of how the world works if it's inconsistent with, with the way that scientists are thinking about it. I see some things so, going on in the chat. <laughs> there's lots of, a, uh, you know, a flurry of text. Uh, going around. First of all, that question was from Filippo. Uh, and, um, and you know, it, it reminds me of something, a paper that we wrote, I think in the, uh, you know, about almost 20 years ago, where we did research on how much students um, learn from demonstrations. I mean, we, we physicists all tend to be very visual and we tend to, and, and this is, I think it's a naive belief that we all have now, including me, is that seeing is believing. And um, in, in, a, in a paper that we wrote, I forgot exactly when, uh, the, the title is something like uh, Classroom Demonstrations, Entertainment or uh, Learning, something like that. 
we we did an experiment where we did demonstrations um, and 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 partitioned a very large class, 250 students in four groups. One group did not see the demonstration. The other just saw the demonstration done as best as possible. The third one had to think about the outcome of the demonstration before seeing it. And the last one was involved in a peer instruction cycle. So they had to predict the outcome of the um, the demonstration and write it down on a piece of paper. Then they had to, they watched the demonstration to write down their observation, and they had to decide whether their prediction was in agreement or not with the um, uh, observation. They had to resolve that that uh, difficulty in small groups, and then we measured how months later they remembered the outcome of the demonstration, whether they were able to to apply the underlying physics in a totally different context. I'll let you first guess which of those four groups, no demo, just a demo, predict or discuss, did the best at the end of the year. Or no, sorry, did the worst at the end of the year. Stony silence. Nope, I, I asked the worst, not the best. Actually, only demo was in, indeed those that did the worst. Those that just saw the demo did the worst. I, I had one example, I mean, I had two scales with a plank, you know, connecting the two scales and an object in the middle. And each scale, each scale uh, indicated 10, uh, 10 uh, pounds or, or whatever. I forgot what the units were. And then move the object to a side to show that one scale doubles up and the other goes to zero. You have to balance not only forces, but also torques. Now, it's a very commonly held misconception that um, that as you move the the object on the plank, it doesn't make any difference because the plank evens out the load. It's a very commonly held misconception. I was surprised at that. So what we found is that many of the students who had seen the demo, for many of the students who had seen the demo, the misconception was reinforced. In fact, one student wrote two months later, as shown in class, it doesn't make any difference where the block is. I went, what? That was not at all what I showed in class. So I, I thought I'd discovered a new psychological phenomenon. So I went to the psychology department, uh, some colleagues in the psychology department, are, I said, listen to this. And you know, I gave the story and my colleague in the psychology tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Eric, you should have known this. <laughs> Why do you like physics? I said, well, because I don't have to remember very much. And sort of, I, I, I get to make a, a model. He said, exactly. You know, the brain doesn't store facts. The brain stores models. So if you have this incorrect model that the block is, you know, that the, the plank is even out the, the load from the block, and you see in class something that is not in agreement with that. You have what you know Piaget calls a cognitive dissonance, but you have no time to resolve that cognitive dissonance because the person in front of the class keeps on talking. You may make a note, but but you you, you can't really think hmm, why is that. Whereas if you either predict it beforehand or you provide an opportunity to discuss, you improve the you you you, you increase the probability that a student will address the cognitive uh, dissonance. And, you know, we found that actually the biggest gain is to be made simply by having the student articulate a prediction of the, of the demo. So I think the take home lesson for me was, I love doing demos, I love showing videos, but that is not enough to resolve a, a misconception. Kristan, you've had your, your hand up. Last no, I just question, at the very end, over. at the very end, because I see it's twelve o'clock. Um, so this is very interesting and very interesting questions, of course. But I have one simpler question. Um, so when did the notebooks disappear from the American system teaching physics and mathematics? When I was studying physics and mathematics, we had a notebook where you put the date in the upper left corner of every class, and then you go down, and at the end you put your homework. And my children complete chaos. They give them some sheets of paper that are not numbered. And it's not clear from which date, what is the homework, where is the homework, which is a homework and what is a, actually a lecture. So I think that, I don't know, maybe you, you do use uh, notebooks, but uh, I have three kids and all of them, complete chaos. They, don't, they have no idea which class is from which date, where is the homework. So in fact, they, 
their grades uh, uh, from time to time went down because they just didn't know that they have a homework. So, I mean, I know that these deeper questions about learning are very important, but I, I mean, how about the notebook? Can somebody tell me if you guys use notebooks, the, the students use notebooks? That depends on the teacher. Because some teachers do that. So, I mean, some, <laughs> that really is a teacher thing, That's not it. really a physics thing. Because I know it really depends. Like for now, for me, as a virtual teacher, I'm sorry, this is Veronica Monty. I'm not looking too good today. That's why my camera ain't on. But um, for some of us teachers, what we do is when we're doing, because I'm virtual, we're completely virtual. So everything is dated for us in our canvas. So when your child is getting something like that, that's that's a conversation you need to have with that teacher because n most of us do not do that. My, my children threaten to kill me if I talk to the teacher about anything. So, uh, <laughs> for some, I can add a little How more. How can embarrass them like that? <laughs> Um, there's also some school-wide programs. By the way, I'm Marta Stuckel, just outside of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, yeah, there's school-wide programs like AVID, um, which push, push teachers to use notebooks and push students to have binders for all their classes. So yeah, the notebooks haven't completely disappeared. It's I mean, just these binders are not total, universal. I don't know. These binders, I mean, these binders are humongous. I, I have no idea why they have to be a binder with sheets that, I mean, it's just... I don't know. I think that, uh, so there is a difference between the college education and the education in school. And the difference is the teenagers are not organized yet. I mean, they're, they, they, not only that they're not organized because they don't know how to do it, but also because their brains are developing. And, and they forget things very often and things like that. And I think that simple organizational things are the beginning of actually structuring the knowledge that they're getting in school. Um, and it's very important. I just didn't see that that kind of thing. And and my children went to uh, some of the top schools in Fairfax County, um, and even there was very chaotic. Um, and physics, I think, and mathematics really require some kind of a structured knowledge. It's a little bit different, I think, guess in literature and history. But that's all I want to say. Great. Well, thank you, Kristan. But above all, thank you so much, Jennifer, for uh, for you know, leading this absolutely fabulous uh, discussion. Let me quickly click since we, we're, we're virtual here, the, the clap hand symbol. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I hope that, that um, people will continue the discussion on, uh, on perusal and on, uh, on Slack. And uh, I greatly look, for, I think that the format is working really well. If you by any chance did not pre-watch uh, uh, Jennifer's uh, talk, then you can still go to perusal and watch it at your own uh, leisure and uh, and comment or or maybe answer some of the unanswered questions because I noticed there are still quite a few very interesting unanswered questions on uh, on the platform. And before I say goodbye, let me announce the next talk, which is February. Help me there, Sarah. What's the date? The 27th, another Saturday. The 27th, when we have Angela Duckworth, uh, who um, after Ken Robinson is uh, the, you know, one of the most popular TED speakers and who wrote a book on grit, um, who will be um, leading the discussion. And of course, we'll pre-record the talk and put it on there. We're really absolutely delighted to, that she accepted uh, to, uh, to give uh, the talk. Because after all, the you know the 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 mindset that you bring to to the classroom is a very great as a student is a very great importance, you know, and determines to a large extent whether or not you'll be successful in the in the field. So hopefully she'll have some good pointers for all of us, regardless of the level we teach at. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone else. I look forward to seeing you in uh, in February.